Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Davey Deathray here, and we've got another interview lined up that I'm super excited for because we're interviewing a buddy of mine from my hometown of Juneau, Alaska. Uh, you're probably going to see a few folks from Juno roll in here as the series goes, but I'm really pumped to have Cole Monroe Chitty on the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Cole. Really appreciate you taking the time, man. Glad to be here, man. Good to see you again. So yeah, I wanted to um, just have you kind of give a rundown to everyone out there in the audience that may not be familiar you know, with your, your work and your art, just kind of like your journey, um, you know, growing up as a kid in Juno and just what got you into art and what moved you from um, music to visual art, or was it kind of a dance going the whole way? So take it away. Sure. Yeah, man. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, my <laughs> grandmother actually gave me a couple of like anatomy books uh, when I was really young. I was probably like five or six or seven. And uh, she even gave me a Frank Frazetta book with all the like the Death Dealer and you know all his classic paintings like Conan stuff shit like nice. that. And uh, and so from there I was just hooked and I started reading comic books, uh, of course like movies and stuff really uh, geared my direction. You know my parents would always let us watch whatever we wanted to watch so just because mm -hmm. they love those movies too. You know and. Uh, so you can see that reflected a lot in my work, at least the work that I love to do and put out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of like the young age. I would even get like in trouble in school for what I was drawing. <laughs> like I remember my parents would get called like at least once every couple of months because they'd be like, uh, it's Christmas time and everyone's drawing Christmas pictures and Cole drew a picture of Santa Claus with a chainsaw and a dead reindeer <laughs> underneath him or something, you know? Yeah. My parents are like, ah, oh, that's normal. It's par for the course. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> oh, so he's he's actually tamed himself a little bit. <laughs> you should see what he draws at home. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and so um, I actually I drew all up through through high school, um, but it kind of tapered off like during high school. Yeah, you because know, you just get bogged down with so many social things at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Um, and it kind of just become became more of like just something I would do in my spare time. You know, like I would doodle a little bit here or there, but I was never really serious about it. And then I started playing music like right out of high school. And that kind of became my main creative focus. Mm -hmm. That's about when we met. And uh, my band moved to Portland shortly after, like a couple of years later. And I think you moved to Portland shortly mm -hmm. after that too, because we met up again there. That yeah. was really cool to see you there and see yeah. you playing and out stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, so all through my twenties, I basically just played music and stopped drawing altogether. Oh wow! Um, and then I met my wife in uh, 2011. The band I was currently in was breaking up, and like I was kind of just done with music in general because Portland's a really tough music scene to mm -hmm. like to do anything in, you know, if you don't mm -hmm. just want to waste away your life basically. Um, and so, uh, I was like, well, what my wife is super creative. She like does ceramics and, uh, like, uh, knitting and, uh, she draws herself and paints and stuff. She's super creative. So she started to bring out that creative side in me again. And so I started to paint, uh, first thing. So I started getting really into color theory. Uh, and layering and stuff like that and then mm -hmm. she was like you know what she was like all your favorite comic artists uh they draw on digital tablets and stuff like that why don't we get you one of those and see what you can do you know and i got one and i think that year it took me about nine months but i released my first comic uh which was a 65 page horror novel called uh kaidan and it was about like this Japanese family and this little girl and a tragedy that happens and like the gateway to the other side was like through water and uh like she was being possessed by her like dead mother and things like that a super creepy story but <laughs> 65 pages in nine yeah. months like that's an undertaking man yeah. uh and I drew I probably drew a few more comics after that uh all horror stuff uh, of my own stories and things like that. Um, but it just, it took so long to do, you know, mm -hmm. all by yourself. Uh, and I got a lot of grat gratification from doing it. Um, but it was just like, it's such hard work, you know? So I kind of stopped doing comics after that. 
Um, and a big, a big driver for me to stop doing comics was I actually started tabling at comic cons. Uh, yeah. and the amount of money that I could make just selling art prints was so much more than selling comic books. Yeah. And I could do an art, I could do an art print in like three or four hours mm-hmm. as opposed to nine months for a 65 page book. So yeah, yeah, exactly. You do the math, you do the math there kind of. Yeah, and it's sort of maybe a little bit easier just to kind of, you know, sell that one-off print because you, if you have all these prints, somebody's going to walk up to your table, they're going to see something that fits, you know, their niche. Like, I'll, what, I'll overlay yeah. some art here, but some of the stuff you shared with me, I mean, it's like you have Bill and Ted, um, Gizmo from the Gremlins, um, mm-hmm. you've got Jack Burton from uh, Big Trouble in Little <laughs> China. So there's like, as somebody can, that's, that's kind of how I am when I go to Comic-Con. I walk, I love purchasing you know, art from independent artists and just like unique pieces that you're not going to find like in a store. So, it's, you yeah. know, you walk up to that table and you're like, do they have my niche thing? Like, do they have, you know, Ash from Evil Dead covered in blood or just something that like I don't have that I'm kind of looking for? Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and like, honestly, like one comic book is really hard to sell to a to a wide audience, right? Yeah. Because it doesn't fit that niche thing. In fact, the funniest thing is uh, one of the comics I did was like my interpretation of uh, La Llorona, which is like uh-huh. a Spanish, like a Mexican uh, ghost story about yeah. a mom that like drowns her children and then she dies in the river and she comes back to haunt everybody and steals their children. And I would have Mexican people, like little old grandmas walk by and they're like, La Llorona, and, yeah. you know, and pick it up and buy it from me. And then yeah. or like kids would come and buy it and they'd be like, I'm going to go show this to my grandma. She told me this story when I was little. It's fucking terrifying, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that book sold like crazy just because of that. So speaking of that niche thing, you know, like you just got to find something that everybody relates to, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Cause that's like the, yeah. old, you know, one of those classic tales that you tell to, to your kids to keep them in line, you know, <laughs> I think it was more just to keep them away from the river, right? There like you the, go. Yeah. Drown it's... in the river. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's like the, uh, you know, up in Southeast Alaska, there's that whole Kushtika thing. Yeah. You know, that yeah. story that's like one of those don't go yeah. in the woods by yourself. Don't go. Yeah, yeah you'll just, get lost. Yeah, yep. totally. And you'll be you'll become one of the Kushtika. They'll turn you into one of them, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah. <laughs> Old Jack from The Shining out there in the in the frozen maze. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ca- cautionary <laughs> tales. Yeah. Yeah. Um, totally. So, so wow. So your wife was just super supportive about like, Hey, I, I see this within you and we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that we just bring out whatever we can and, uh, you yeah. know, get you going yeah. on another track. And I, that's one of the toughest things to do. Like I think as a creative person is sort of dealing with, um, switching tracks or like moving on from, um, you know, you have that creative exercise of, you know, playing music. I, I was doing the same kind of thing, you know, like, music was such a big part of my life. It just, you know, I'm sure you know that it can consume like 80% of your existence or you're thinking about it when you go to bed and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, once that, when that comes to a halt or you just kind of see that that time is uh, nearing its end, it can be kind of tough to sort of pick up the pieces. That's awesome that you were able to find that relatively quick. Um, Because I think like for me, I took this huge break and it's sort of like, you know, it rattles around in your brain and you just sort of, you need that outlet to feel like yourself. Um, So that's really cool. And it it comes full circle doing doodling as a kid, getting in trouble in school, like Matt Groening and all the great artists. I'm sure they all have those stories where they're like, oh yeah, I got in trouble. (laughs) And then somebody was like, hey, well, why don't we turn this into a positive, you know? Yeah, Um, why don't we foster that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. God forbid we uh, take your gift and try to make it something good. <laughs> so um, you had mentioned um, uh, Conan the Barbarian. Were there any, like, what were some of the early works that you saw when you were a kid? As far as, like, films go, you were talking about your parents kind of let you watch whatever you wanted to watch. Were there certain, um, like, horror movies in the 80s or something that, um, you know, really kind of inspired you at a young age and kicked that off, oh, yeah. you know, more than any of the others? Oh, yeah. Well, my... My favorite baddie of all time is is Freddy, you know. Like I think I watched probably parts of some of the movies, but I remember in '91 when Freddy's Dead came out, mm-hmm. uh, there was a there was a comic book that coincided with it that came with 3D glasses, and it was like basically the comic novelization of Freddy's Dead, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I found that on the shelf. It was like on the shelf at Super Bear and Juno. That is like, wild. 
Yeah, they used to sell crazy <laughs> comics there, man. And like, uh, and I picked it up and I was like, Freddy. Uh, and so we went and saw it in the theater and everything. And then we went home and rented all the movies. And like, I think that was my first, like, uh, this is mine moment, you know, mm-hmm. like, because before that, uh, my parents would watch, we'd just be scrolling through like uh, TNT movies for guys who like movies, you know, and it'd be yeah. like aliens. It'd be James Cameron's aliens on, you know, mm-hmm. or uh, Terminator or predator you know um and so and and those were also really popular comic books at the time through dark Mm -hmm. horse uh Mm -hmm. so uh i started getting all into that stuff um and that kind of like those were like probably my favorites like i could still probably say like of that era of movies and that genre like uh like sci-fi horror, like Aliens and Predator and Terminator mm-hmm. are easily like the top three for me. Um, and then like, as far as big baddies go, it's always going to be Freddy. Like there's nobody else to me, you know, he's got such a personality and like, he makes me laugh. Uh, I even like, when I was really young, I would like convince myself that he was my buddy just so I wouldn't be scared of him, you know, like, gotcha, yeah. oh, I just, I just watched a Freddy movie and I'm going to bed and like, I go to the bathroom with star cat and I'm like, all right, Freddy's my buddy. He's not going to attack me. You know? Yeah. That, that, <laughs> right. I was going to, yeah, that person, do. the personality of Freddy is such a, a big one. I think for, that's what I yeah. notice when I talk to people that, that really like yeah. him. Cause I'm like, Michael's my guy. I, I kind of like yeah. the mystery, but also, you know, there's Freddy and Chucky's got plenty of personality um, mm-hmm. all, all the ghost face characters from Scream um, all have that yep. personality as well. Is there yep. what's so if you had to pick your favorite A Nightmare on Elm Street film, are you going with the original or are you kind of in that, no way. you know, that part three <laughs> spot where he's found his personality a little bit more? What, what, what do you got? No way. <laughs> Those are probably my uh, maybe number three and four. Okay. But. I love New Nightmare more than any other mm. other Freddy movies. Yeah, um, I th- I think New Nightmare was Wes Craven's magnum opus. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I were to rank the top four, yeah, it'd be uh, New Nightmare. Then probably Freddy's Dead. I'm just a sucker for oh, it. Oh, really? Yeah, I've okay. Loved I've loved it ever since I was a little kid. Um, it really it takes the character and makes it not as serious, which I kind of love. You know, like mm-hmm. it's a horror. They don't make horror movies for kids anymore. And when they do, they yeah. really suck. Like Five Nights at Freddy's, you know, mm-hmm. uh, they're just not good movies at all. But I feel like you could show Freddy's Dead to like a nine year old and they'd be, they would love it. Yeah. One of my buddies that I was hanging out with, well, we were in like fourth grade or something like that. He, he had an older yeah. sister and she had like the VHS tape. So I'd go over and uh hang out shout out to tim tagney uh <laughs> go and hang out at his house and we'd watch the old movies and we played the nes game which is one of the rare oh, yeah. occasions of ljn like really getting it right i think that um a nightmare yep. on elm street video game is really fun like and it it's actually another rare occasion of an nes game that does a pretty good approximation of what the film is you know, so mm-hmm. you have to grab the boom box to wake up. You need to grab the coffee so you right. can stay away. Like they actually have things in that game that make sense. You know, it's not like the back to the future nightmare or anything right. like that. Right. But, uh, but yeah, that was like right at that time. And, and then I went and hung out at, uh, there was like a bunch of girls having a sleepover just right down the street from, from where we lived over, uh, right near Glacier Valley. And, um, they, the mom put on the very first nightmare on Elm street. And that exactly. was pretty freaky oh, yeah. at that time, you know, to, to oh, see yeah. that that one because that one takes it. Pre- the first two take it pretty seriously. Like it's pretty dark. Yeah, the yeah. first one's really dark. Um, like this is God, you know. Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's some stuff that just goes over your head as a kid. You know, sure. you're watching it again and you're like, wow, that was really fucked up. You know? Yeah, and he <laughs> still has a sense of humor, but it's much more that like that sinister kind of sense of humor. Whereas, yeah, Freddy's yeah. Dead. It's kind of like a. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. he's kind of like Saturday morning cartoon in uh, Freddy's yeah. Dead. And uh, I mean, right down to like the power glove, like all that kind of stuff. And the and, moving the spikes like, yeah. the, like oh. the Wiley Coyote. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't, isn't that the one where he does the Wicked Witch thing? Yeah. He's like, yeah. I'm going to get you and your precious soul or whatever, your pretty yeah. soul or whatever. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that one's got, yeah. gosh, Breck and Meyer and Seth Green are in that movie before they really popped off. You got Roseanne yeah, so like, and Tom Arnold. 
it was like a freddy movie for the family mm -hmm. is what it felt like you know which is what i loved about it because like they would that would never fly anymore you know no it would have to be like yeah. a one-off tv series or they'd probably just do that as a straight comic book with no screen adaptation right now you know you right. just get that yeah, yeah. and then yeah, yeah new nightmare is a a, a freddy movie about the family kind of you know it's uh that I, I love how they took that. I kind of wish with Scream they would sort of go back to that formula to pay homage, even greater homage to Wes. Yeah. Like, do a movie yeah. where you bring back Nev Campbell. You can also bring back David Arquette. And it's the people themselves, not the like the actors themselves, are being hunted by a real life ghost face. So there's no yeah. m movie. It's just about them. Like, I think that's kind of like the way they should go with Scream. I, I thought the last couple Screams were like, okay. Um, but definitely not too inspiring. That's, and third act, giving them too much. They definitely were not okay. <laughs> well, it, well, it's like it's like there's not like a bad movie in the franchise. You know, there's not a movie in the franchise that totally drops the ball. But I think the last act of five and this six are one. rough. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole last twenty minutes, I was like pissed off. I'm like, I'm pretty Man. sure all the characters in number six, the only things they said were, "I'm so scared," the whole time. Yeah. Well, and we're the, the, we're the, what do they call themselves? The fabulous four or whatever. And then the, we're the fabulous four and we're really scared. The, the core, their, the core four, the core four. Yeah. And that was like their entire, that was their entire character. I'm yeah. scared. Yeah. And, and then and they had to keep telling the audience. <laughs> exactly. And, and also like, I think by the time they get to the killer reveal, especially in part six, um, it just felt like the rug was pulled out from under the audience. I, I was like, this is not well earned and doesn't really make sense. Yeah. So I was kind of the whole entire last act, even though there's like plenty of good like action to watch. I was just sitting there like, I'm kind of pissed off that this is the way they went. Like, and I'm like, I'm now I'm not enjoying the rest of your movie. Like the most important part of your movie that I should be engaged with. I'm to I've checked out and you've kind of just like pissed me off. And and in part five, that was the first time where I called it like from pretty much like the first 15 minutes. I was like, I think it's this person and that person. And I've oh, never, man. I've never been able to do that in any of the screen movies, but yeah. I, and I, I felt like they were a little on the nose with, uh, maybe we'll talk about it later. We can get into like the heavy handedness of filmmaking, but I felt like the um, you know, once they give their reasoning for being the killers in Scream Five, I was like, "Man, this is so over the top!" Like, like is that the one where it's both? They're both women, right? No, it's the one where it's like the couple that met on online message boards because they felt like oh, the stab yeah. series wasn't being taken seriously, That's and right. like yeah. this whole like you call, they call us toxic just because we love something. I'm like, man, they're really really hammering at home that you have to now you have to like this movie and not only that you have right. to like every movie that hollywood puts out or else you're just toxic it's not like right. you actually have right. an opinion no if you don't like it you're just toxic it's like right. oh, okay right. well if we marginalize everyone that doesn't like our movies i guess it makes it easier to keep on putting out mediocre films um but uh True. keep the bar low yeah exactly yeah um yeah. and now i'm on my soapbox i've totally gotten away from <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when I start talking about movies. I'm like, oh, I'll just oh, take man. this logical leap from uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare and jump over to ripping on the new Scream movies. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, Davey. Um, so speaking of uh, Wes... No, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I think the thing about Wes, Wes Craven's New Nightmare that's so good is um, it really boils Freddy back down into um, an idea more than just the character mm -hmm. of Freddy, like which I believe by Freddy's dead, he definitely became, he just became a character of Freddy, right? Like he's the thing that sells, he's the thing that sells lunch boxes yeah. and, you know, toys and things like that. Um, but with Wes Craven's New Nightmare, they took it back to the idea stage and they said, what about Freddy makes him scary? And I think the thing that makes him scary is, whether or not you believe in him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that so, he's a, that uh, he's a dream demon, that it's not just, it's an entity. It's not just the one yeah. Freddy. There's like yeah. multiple, you know, that he can take on different forms. Yeah. Demon. And I love how Wes, Wes explained that like the movies were the only things keeping him captive, you know, mm -hmm. like a genie in a bottle kind of. Yeah. No, it's a, um, yeah. it's, it's so well motivated and mapped out. It's, and that's probably mm -hmm. one of the dif most difficult things to do as a series goes on 
is you kind of have to bring it back to a simple sort of like the La Llorona. Like you have to bring it back to like, how can I make this a simple folk tale where there's right. really only a few things that we're worried about and, and the characters act within those parameters. We're not trying to like, you know, connect it to every other movie, right. um, you right. know, or, or make it make sense. You know, I think that that yeah. can, you can get into some trouble, which, you know, they've experienced that in the Halloween series. I think pretty much every slasher series kind of gets to that point, you know, like with Chucky, yeah. they decided to go like the horror comedy route to sort of slip out from under that and take yep. it to the, the meta realm that I think Wes is probably the biggest, uh, he's got the biggest hand in um, bringing horror creating. into that. Yeah, 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 creating and then also sort of like dropping the facade in horror and allowing people to do horror films that are self-aware and just, um, you know, I know that's like a relatively, this whole self-aware thing is like relatively new as far as storytelling goes. So especially in the horror world, yeah, he gets to bring it right back um, have you seen, uh, Dylan's new nightmare? Did you see that fan film? Mm -hmm. What do yeah. you think? Yeah. I, I liked it. Um, you know, the, my only gripe about a lot of fan films is how short they are. And that one mm -hmm. was particularly short. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think with what they did with it, it was good, you know, for what it was. Yeah. Bringing it back to that yeah. new nightmare. Do you, did you feel like they, yeah. they captured that, that spirit to a certain degree? Uh, I know that it, it's sort of in between it's cause it's kind of like demon Freddy meets Freddy from Freddy's revenge, like that more wet look. So it's kind of like the two worlds yeah. meeting. Yeah. Or like, uh, what Freddy looked like at the end of Freddy versus Jason when he was mm -hmm. underwater and he's like, he's had like the red demon face. Right. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Like, I understand what they're trying to do with it, but I think like Freddy's dead already kind of said everything, or I mean, new nightmare already said everything it needed to say. Like, the scene where Nancy's talking to, or Heather's talking to Robert on the phone and Robert's painting, mm -hmm. uh, and he's painting Freddie. Yeah. And she goes, he's in my dreams, but it's not him. You know, it's not you. It's like, and he goes, what? It's darker, more evil, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was like, and, and the costume change and stuff mm -hmm. with Freddie with the leather leather pants and just like, he was so iconic. He was like, I'm a rock star basically with his trench yeah, coat, the, the trench coat. collar, yeah. you know, and the new glove that didn't have to look like the old thing. It was like more part of him. It wasn't like you couldn't mm -hmm. take it off. A little right? more organic. Yeah. You couldn't take it off. Like that was always Freddie's weakness. If you could take his glove, then like, mm -hmm. what is he? You know, you can't do anything to you at that point. So like, um, I think that movie already kind of said everything that needed to be say, said about like meta Freddy, the meta idea of Freddy, mm -hmm. right? So, but I do appreciate people trying to um, create something new in the space and still keep the character alive. Yeah. You know, because I think we're never going to get another Robert England horror movie uh, or Freddy movie, I mean, yeah. um, which is, which is the real irony. You know, I talk about, I was talking about how New Nightmare, um, it's sort of like the idea of Freddy, you know, and how he's sort of a story that can be told. But the irony is that I don't think anybody else is ever going to be able to play Freddy very well, right? Like people will be able to do it, but not well. Mm -hmm. um, and not as good because it'll always be Robert England, you know, which, and so the irony is like uh, people like Jason and Michael Myers can be played by anybody, yeah. right? Because they just have a mask on. So. Doesn't mean it's always a good interpretation, it but yes, and anyone. Mean that. I will agree. Yeah. I, will agree. I mean, I have my favorites. I yeah, because there are those weird subtleties in those characters where it's like, yeah, somebody just you know the way that, like James Jude Courtney, the way that he took on Michael in the new Halloween movies, I thought was about as close as I've seen since Nick Castle. And granted, he's like a little bit bigger than him, but they found somebody that had that. You know, he's not too bulky. He's not like Tyler Maine in the Rob Zombie movies where I'm like, oh God. I, I had a tougher time being scared of that version of Michael because he was so <laughs> overpowered that I'm like, well, what's the point? It's like running zombies. You might as well just give in and let him take you down. Like I, what scared me about Michael is that it, this is just a regular sized guy that can mm -hmm. pick his spot and overpower you at the right moment, you know? Yeah, he's um, kind of more tactical. He's always more tactical than anything else. Yeah, yeah. People, he's kind of like a cat. He just sort of like waits mm -hmm. and pounces at the right time. Right. And um, right. yeah, Freddie, there's definitely, you know, within the fandom, um, you know, I see it on Twitter, on social media, there is like a gatekeeping sort of uh, mentality around uh, Robert England playing Freddie. And it's like a lot of people just don't even want to see 
the attempt. You know, they're just well, we've already seen an attempt. So. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and but that, and yeah, that thing is like Jackie Earl Haley is an accomplished performer, but that whole movie, like, I think I turned it off like twenty minutes in because it just wasn't working for me. Like, just yeah. everything about it, I was like, this whole essence is not jiving with me. And I liked the uh, Marcus Nispel. Um, Friday the 13th remake from 09. Like, mm-hmm. like I enjoyed that movie. I thought it was a good yeah. approximation of those first four movies. Everyone's like, oh, it's a bunch of hot people getting killed and, and they're dumb and I don't like them. And I'm like, have you seen the Friday the 13th movie? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Like, totally. It seems like you don't know what these movies are all about. Yeah. Cause this one pretty if much. Anything, I, if anything, I'd say that they changed Jason more than anything else about the movies. They turned yeah. him into like a hillbilly tactical mm-hmm. trapper like hunter guy yeah i know? i actually i really liked that it was the most personality mm-hmm. that i've felt that jason has been given on screen and i to me like yeah. the first time i watched it i was like oh jason is a spider and right. crystal right. lake is his web and these people have right. they've tripped his little trip wires and they've rung his bell and he pops out like a trapdoor spider and takes you down because that's the only area where he knew safety and he knew like love from his mother and so yeah. really jason is just protecting his home like it's a home right. invasion movie <laughs> just flipped <laughs> you know flipped. and and jason yeah. the brutality that uh Derek Mears had you know like flipping the canoes turning on the floodlights i was just like man jason is like this is really cool like i i just yeah. i never thought i would see a jason like this and it's too bad they haven't been able to go back and that yeah, was actually he could pull a tarp off something and make it look menacing. <laughs> oh yeah. And there's yeah. that shot where he's like standing on the roof of the house and he's like backlit and he's got that yeah. like Victorian like coat kind of that he's wearing. Yeah, and, it's not like breathing heavy. Like. Yeah. And then he, also the way he uses like a different kind of camp implement of destruction. Like he gets to throw the ax like 20 yards to get the guy in the back. You know, he's always mm-hmm. doing, he shoots the arrow through the guy's like head or whatever while they're riding on the bike, bi- uh, the, the yeah. boat. In the in the lake, yep. and I'm just like yep. I love that. I love seeing Jason. Jason should use all the stuff you practice at camp. That's what you know. That's the theme. So um, yep. I like that they yep. brought that back too. And I was going to ask you about that. Um, you know, is there obviously you you know I would imagine you'd like to see Freddie come back if they can do it justice and cast the right person. Are there any other? Um, like horror icons that you want to see return to the screen? Or are you kind of in the mode now where like you would just like to see more original ideas out there? I'm I'm actually a big fan of the new Chucky show that they're mm-hmm. doing on, I don't remember what streaming it's on, Is but it it's AMC, pretty good. AMC? Something yeah. Like it's, it's, it's honestly not that bad. Um, so I don't think, I don't think bringing back horror icons is necessarily a bad thing. I just want people to do it right. You know, and and mm-hmm. make it entertaining, and don't do it with some kind of an agenda. Although sometimes even that works. Like I'm a fan of the newer Hellraiser movie that had a trans person as a centipede. You know, mm-hmm. um, when it fits with that uh, story, right? Because it, P- it Pinhead is well, supposed yeah. to, but and Pinhead is supposed to be Pinhead More isn't. Um, yeah, like in the, in the book, he's yeah. yeah, not a man yeah. or a woman. Yeah, right, right. Um, but yeah, if you're gonna bring if you're gonna bring old characters back, just do it right. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's my biggest problem with the Star Wars movies, just not doing the characters right. Holy like, cow! Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, you know, we can get and into I just, that. I, <laughs> no, we don't have to, but it's just an example. Um, but I would hate to see them do that to you know something I hold near and dear like Freddy. You know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Is there anyone that you could think of that you would like that you would like to like see to see take come on back? Freddy? Or or it's or play Freddy, any actor right now that you think oh, can do it justice? Because oh. I did a video on that uh, Jared Bankins guy from yeah. Twisted Metal. He just had this this look where I was like, man, I I like the fact that he's just relatively unknown, but he seemed to in that within that character he relishes like the torture that he puts people through, and I'm like, mm. right right from there I was like, man, this guy could do Freddy. Like and yeah. he's the perfect age to where he could play him for five or six movies as long as they write the you know a good right. story for him. I think uh, I I unfortunately haven't seen him act, but I saw your video and I agreed with how he looked and everything mm-hmm. would be a good fit. Um, but you know I I hate to like pinpoint anybody because it just isn't working in my head. But maybe 
maybe Bill Skarsgård, the guy that played Pennywise. Okay. You know, he, seems, yeah. he seems to be able to take an iconic character already at, at least make it kind of interesting. So mm -hmm. he's got um, that. That was my of... biggest my biggest problem with Jackie or Haley is it just wasn't interesting at all. You know. Yeah, they tried to go like the realistic route with it, and it's mm -hmm. just sort of like, well, I, the whole idea of Freddy is so outlandish that like. Yeah. Why I try to make him look like a real burn victim? It's just yeah. not really. And, and Bill Skarsgård in uh, Barbarian actually got to show a little more of his human side. Like I think they like to put him under makeup a lot in a lot mm -hmm. of his roles. But mm -hmm. um, in Barbarian, the whole first third of that movie is him and the girl, and that you don't know really what's going on. You remember mm -hmm. that movie a couple years ago? You know what? I have not seen Barbarian yet. I've, oh I'm man! I, I know. So I could do a. I finally watched it on that one because there are movies that just slip through, yeah. and then for whatever reason, um, I just... I recommend. Okay. I recommend. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but but so the first third of the movie, basically, he's just like staying at a an Airbnb, and this girl shows up, and she's like, "Wait, I had the Airbnb booked," and he's like, "Oh, but I had it booked too," and they kept both kind of there you know and it's this mm -hmm. whole kind of like who do you trust mm -hmm. you know because she's sort of in a vulnerable situation but he's trying to be super nice about it and they're fr trying to find some common ground yeah you know um but it's kind of creepy at the same time you know because they're out in the middle of nowhere and like run down new jersey or whatever oh, okay right and like uh uh yeah so they you get to see a little more of his human side in that role and so i think after seeing that i think i could see him maybe taking on the glove but mm -hmm. You know, he does, again, does kind of have a, a rubber face. He's got a little bit of that yeah, Jim Carrey yeah. quality to his face where it seems like right. uh, he gets mentioned for a lot of roles. And I think that's, you know, yeah. it's those actors that have all those different kinds of looks. Um, yeah. So if you're going to have an actor for Freddie, they have to have a face, you know, like for sure. Yeah, they have to. Man, you've got to you almost want somebody that's like stand up comedy um, chops because Freddie's yeah. got to have that personality. Um, and Why not Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey's only what sixty. Yeah, good. he's a he's a bit old, right? You know, Don't, I mean, you want to find somebody that's in like their late thirties, ideally, because maybe you want to shoot sure. some of that um, Freddie as a human. You know, maybe you want to show a little bit of that instead of just doing a straight remake of the original film. Maybe you do want right. that opening twenty five minutes to be um, about Freddie as a human and everything he mm -hmm. was doing that kind of lays the ground. You know, instead of having to, because we all know that about Freddy. So you might as you either sure. never, never show it. If you reboot it, you never show it. Cause we already know it, or you just get it out of the way at the beginning and then we can right. sort of move on. Right. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. He, that, uh, scars guard guy, he is, man, he's so great in pretty much everything. His, dude, yeah. his Pennywise is creepy as all get out. He cracks me up in Deadpool too. Mm -hmm. He's like the character that just vomits all over everything. What's his uh, yeah. zeitgeist or whatever is is that the character's name? Something like that. I, I don't remember the character. Yeah, it, I think a... I, I think that's what yeah. it is because it stuck out to me that it's called zeitgeist and he just like vomits all over everyone. I'm like, that's that's pretty. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, hell yeah! Well, man, we we knocked out some of our horror questions that I had here for you. But you know, I was uh, hoping you could tell us a little bit about just all the avenues that your art has taken you. You know, how it's shaped your life experience going from, you know, living in such a small town like Juno to getting to see a bit more of the world playing music. And then, um, you know, you're on the East Coast now. You're living in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so yep. just like all that, the you know, just all the places that art's uh, taken you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I think we were last talking about how I was doing a lot of comic conventions and stuff. Mm -hmm it was just it was it was paying pretty well to just draw all the time and uh uh i started playing board games around the same time and started to design some of my own board games as well mm -hmm. so uh that kind of brought me into this whole other world of production and print and stuff like that and i started making all my own components and uh drawing all my own cards for those and stuff like that and uh going out to play test nights and play testing my designs, things like that. Um, and I kind of decided that that's um, a place that needed more artists and more creatives to be involved. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of it was because I, I kind of started to get a little disillusioned with the comic con scene. Um, 
And it was because, again, being in Portland, uh, Rose City Comic Con and Emerald City up in Seattle are two of the biggest cons on the West Coast. And I would do those every year. And starting to get to the point where the artist alley was overtaking everything else within the con. And so, you know, uh, they started upping table prices and like mm -hmm. threatening artists uh, that if they didn't pay on the weekend for their next year's spot, they would be pushed out forever, you know, um, because I mean, I can be a little sympathetic to the organizers for things like that because they only have so much space and everybody wants to get in, you know, so they have mm -hmm. to like, but, and, and they're also, you know, really in a capitalist society, which is wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they have to make money mm -hmm. and they saw potential to make more money, which is great. Uh, so I started getting a little disillusioned by that and actually stopped doing comic cons altogether, except for, some smaller ones that allowed me to spend more time on board games and uh i kind of got a couple of big breaks early on and got to do some big projects um for some kickstarter board games and so not only was i doing the card art and the rule books and the box art the packaging but i was also doing the kickstarter campaigns themselves so i would lay out the entire kickstarter page I would do all the marketing for the project. Mm -hmm. And these are projects that last anywhere from a year to two years. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of weird because I went a little bit full circle from uh, doing comic books that would take me like a year to make uh, to just wanting to do art prints that only took like, you know, a couple hours to make and I could just churn them out over the months, you know, yeah. to then working on projects that, you know, we're going to take a couple of years to complete mm -hmm. again, you know? Um, yeah. So that's kind of the avenue that it took me. Um, and now, uh, ever since the pandy happened, I lost my day job because uh, I was working in food service, just doing coffee still like part time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was doing board game stuff too on the side. Uh, so the pandy happened, lost the job, and I was just like, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna do it full time and see what happens. Yeah. And it's kind of brought me here, uh, to where I'm working for myself. Um, I take on clients all the time, I've got a couple of avenues to get clients, and you know, I'll have projects that take me a week to do up to projects that I'm still working on for like a year at a time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just dep depending on the needs, um, of the you know, the people behind the project right yeah pretty much yeah and then so, i i didn't know you were doing the marketing as well is that something that you just sort of taught yourself or just learned through promotion as like being a musician and all you just kind of take what yeah, you had gathered up to that point and been like well i'll just do what i've been doing for me i'll just do for you guys in your project yeah it's kind of like just guerrilla marketing tactics you yeah. know it's just what works and a lot of it is online you know so it's like we already have the platforms that facilitate marketing, like, mm -hmm. you know, Instagram and Facebook and whatever else. Uh, so basically when I say marketing, I'm not the one really pushing it all. Like I'll just make the, the, the designs that they need the art to for push, it. to push those platforms themselves. Yeah. yeah. And then are you, when it comes to like character designs, are you, are you designing the characters just based on like, are they writing down notes for you about, you know what certain stuff want, or th how much freedom do you have i guess when uh doing character design for the board it games? varies from it varies from project to project for sure um <clears throat> like i had one of my first one of my really big projects the ghost betwixt oh, um yeah. yeah it's like uh it's a it's a dungeon crawler game which means like you control characters and you're all kind of on the same team and you're like going through an area and you're collecting items mm -hmm. uh and like uh beefing up your characters basically like sort of like an rpg video game like a, like a diablo or something like that you control yeah. a party of characters right and you're making them all badass as you go through a certain amount of levels but the ghost betwixt is like it takes place in the 90s uh in like a midwestern town and it's a family of characters so four characters that you play in a family uh and your weapons are things like homemade slingshots and like uh you know the hockey stick and things uh -huh. like that yeah and, is that uh, the one that's got the 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 bat the um 
the like the Shaun of the Dead cricket bat. Is that yeah, that the in cricket there? Yeah. bat. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and like the story is like their their third child uh, got kidnapped by the local haunted house, uh, and you have to go into the haunted house and find him and rescue him, basically. And that takes place over like six levels, six or eight levels. Uh, and the whole thing can be played within like probably 24 hours or something like that. But it's the type of game you, you bring to the table and you take it down, you bring back to the table, you keep mm-hmm. coming back to it until you're finished with it, you know. Um, that was a really cool first project to do. Um, but with that one, the designer really, really had um, an idea of what he wanted the characters to be, you mm-hmm. know, who he wanted them to be, what he wanted them to look like. But I'll get games like uh, I just did a card game just called Zombie Apocalypse that's on Amazon. And uh, they basically had a super low budget. So I was willing to work with them with one caveat. I said, I'll do all this stuff. I'll do all the art that you guys need if you let me do whatever I want. Yeah. And they were like, all right. Yeah. I I guess (laughs) if that's the only way we're going to get you, then that's what we'll do. So yeah. Uh, I was able to create all the art from that from the ground up uh, in my own style and kind of make it something that I wanted it to be with them. You know? Hell yeah. 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 So it, it kind of it kind of varies whether or not I have full uh, creative control or not. Mm-hmm. And that could be a good or a bad thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's nice to have that direction, right? Because it's like, yeah, uh, you know, especially if you're, if you're approaching it from a, a job like professional standpoint, it's like, well, yeah, mm-hmm. let's just, just tell me, tell me what you want and, and I'll do the work to bring that to life. And then, yeah, I guess it's, it's also nice just to have a little bit of everything to where sometimes you, you do have that freedom, you know, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's gotta be, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about is just, you know, finding that balance between, um, you know, doing something for a living and then doing something to, you know, kind of satisfy your own creative juices Um, Do you find that you try to find a little bit of both in each thing you do? Or do you find that like when you're, when you jump from something that's like a job and then you jump back into just doing something for you, is it difficult to switch gears or what's that whole experience like? Um, well, I mean, since doing it for my job for so long, like I try to spend as much time away from the computer as I can when I'm not working, uh, unfortunately, nowadays. But um, when I do get into a piece for that's for me um, that I'm excited about doing, uh, I'm super into it. Like, like you know, pencils down, tongue hanging out, <laughs> just going <laughs> for it. Uh, and I'll work on a piece all night and, and get it done, you know, because I, it's something I want to do. Um, but is it hard to switch gears? Not so much. It's kind of all the same, you know? Okay. I'm, I'm just putting the pencil to the screen and, and do what needs to be done most of the time. Um, I'd say that um, the more fulfilling thing for me nowadays is uh, satisfying my clients. Because, like, like, I can do – I've never been one to really make art that I want other people to enjoy, right? Um, I know there's a lot of artists out there that are like, my audience needs to find meaning in my art or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, I've never really understood that. Like, I'm, I'm not a fan of abstract art or anything. I don't I don't really care what other people think of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more on a technical level of like, you know, the color theory and the composition of the piece. Mm-hmm. Um, uh whether or not it resonates with you personally because of the subject matter you know that sort of stuff like i'm not going to make like you know political art or things like that you know because i don't i don't really care what other people think about that um so uh when i do get i get those feelings now from making my clients happy and making their whatever world they've created or idea they've created come to life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm able to do that for them. Uh, And it's a, it's a crazy cool feeling like uh, with the ghost betwixt with Dustin, like he'd been working on that game for, I don't know, five years, you know, to, 
to get it to a point where it was like a real game that you could play, mm-hmm. you know. And then uh, me and another guy, Travis Hansen, uh, came in and made it look amazing and made it into an actual game that you could turn into a product and sell to people, you know. Yeah. So Yeah, you're, you're able to bring somebody else's creative idea to, to life, mm-hmm. you know. And you're able to play... Yep just play that role. I think that's, it's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, any other, other kind of performance, like everyone has a role they have to play. So yeah, I can totally understand how satisfying that's gotta be to be like, cool. I did this. This person is beaming now because their, their piece, their creative piece has now gone beyond even what they could imagine. I think that's like, right. that's one of those fun things, you know, even from playing music with people or whatever, when you realize, oh, wow, this person's bringing something to the table that's making what I, my, the idea that I came up with, it, they're making it better and they're making it right. like more real to life and something that hopefully right. like more people would be able to enjoy, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, like like if you were to ever work with an actual producer or something on your album, yeah. you know, like, yeah. Like they're gonna make your songs all sound amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I guess to address a little more of the question um, about like um, pivoting and like still having creativity be for me and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think as an artist, it's all about finding different uh, channels and avenues to release your art. Um, which you know, online there's so many. Um, I have a T-shirt site on T Public. Uh, that I upload designs to regularly and it doesn't cost me anything to upload the design at all. Mm -hmm. I just get, and they like print it and ship it to whoever buys it. And I just get a kickback, you know? So it's just like drop shipping print on demand of my designs on t-shirts, you know, and I never have to touch it again. But for those, like I get to be really creative and be like, what kind of t-shirt would I want to wear? You know, I have a, I have a really cool, uh, one of, uh, Salem's lot where it's got like the master's head and then it's got uh, the guy yeah. stabbing him in the coffin, you know, yeah. uh, that's an awesome t-shirt. I got like an awesome tremors t-shirt on there with the graboid, you know, like, yeah. uh, t-shirt art's way different. It's like, uh, than what I usually do. I usually do kind of like poster style art or like, mm-hmm. you know, um, pop art. Uh, but t-shirt art is way different. Like you get to think about like, okay, if I were to make all the blacks transparent, so this looks cool on a black t-shirt, like the shirt you're wearing right now, yeah. you know, what, how would I do that? And like with that design, they just drew it all in white or they probably drew the black lines first. And then they just sort of like took all the black out of it yeah, you know, and then put it on a black shirt. And those black, that black is all, all back already, you know? Exactly. So it's really yeah. cool. It's a really cool way to think about like how you're going to compose a piece and how you're going to design it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And even just like, yeah, taking a moment from a film, you know, mm-hmm. like you've got like your yeah. Jack Burton piece. He's got like the lipstick on, right? Cause right. <laughs> that's like the, the part of the movie where he has that on. So it's like those, yeah. those are pieces of art where I'm like, Oh, that's like a really specific moment from a film that like mm-hmm. somebody would love to have represented on a shirt, you know, or the just, uh, sloth from the Goonies when yeah. he rips his shirt up and he's got the Superman. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, I'll drop a link just so everyone knows you can check the description below for the links to Cole's art, to the t-shirt shop, to all that stuff. So you guys can uh, purchase the games he's been working on, uh, purchase any of his prints and the t-shirts as well. So check those links out below. Are there any like illustrators or like comic book artists um, that, you know, have like a that either you love going back to um, or even like modern artists that are working that you find as uh, you know, that just kind of when you're ready to step away from the computer and maybe pull out a comic book or something that you uh, look up to or that inspire you, um, you know, when yeah, you're not creating yeah. yourself. Yeah. So one of my favorites uh, over the past uh, decade or so has been uh, Francesco Francavia. He does like, he's mostly like a comic book cover artist but uh he also does full runs he did the uh afterlife with archie series which was like sort of like a the old archie comics but there's like zombies and stuff Mm. like that he's done a bunch of batman you know he's done a bunch of stuff but his stuff is really cool it's like uh chiroscuro which is like heavy heavy black areas and shadows with like splashes of like flat color and stuff like that 
Yeah, so Francesco Francavia, amazing. Just like Google him and look at some of the images because they're fucking awesome. The way he uses color uh, versus black is just amazing. And then uh, like older stuff, like Bernie Wrightson is like one of my favorite artists of all time. Uh, again, he worked a lot in black and white. He did like a lot for the old like creepy comics, creepy and eerie comics and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So really cool horror art. Um with just like pen marks all over the place. Like he was not afraid to just like leave things scribbly and kind of mm. really dark looking. I love Stan Sakai. Uh, he did the Yosagi Yojimbo uh, books, who was like a character that was in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but he kind of, he had all his own stuff. Those are all like Ronin samurai stories of like this rabbit, really cool stuff. Um, I kind of more look at, for comics, I kind of look at, uh, writers more than the artists right. that are doing the work because honestly i can, like a lot of comics are pretty but if the story's not any good i'm not sure. gonna be able to sit through it so you know yeah. um yeah so i i mean as far as writing goes like i love garth enos and his work you know on the boys and uh punisher and all sorts of stuff you know mm -hmm. um i love uh, uh the guy that wrote conan you know howard He's amazing. Um, Alan Moore, mm -hmm. all his stuff is great, like an old Swamp Thing comics and stuff like that. It's funny you mentioned like that kind of scribbly uh, art style because I definitely see that within your work. I, and I that's something that I really like seeing in illustration. Like I became, um, you know, when they did, you remember when Marvel did the whole like Fatal Attractions thing back in like the mm -hmm. early 90s and... Uh, Wolverine with has all the, adamantium with all the taken out. With all the hologram cards yep. on the... Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah each X-Men yeah. comic had a different one. And uh, mm -hmm. so An Andy Kubert did X-Men 25, where Wolverine gets his adamantium ripped out. And then his brother, Adam, did Wolverine 75. That's the follow-up to that. And he's always been one of my favorites because of that. That, like, kind of dirty, scribbly, like, all the little details and, like, nicks in Wolverine's face. And just, yeah. like, yeah. I was like, man, there's so much. Just, I imagine how much time it takes. But then also how, like, liberating it must be as an artist to be like, I'm not going to make this clean. Like, I'm going to make this, like, look a little dirty the way real life looks dirty. And, you know, yeah. you can like, and you can see that in the background that we have here. And I'm sure in a lot of the other images that we'll, we'll share with the, the audience here, but just a little bit of that rough, like real to life, um, you know, not trying to make things look too clean, uh, really dig that style there. Um, and you certainly bring it over to like the, the board game side as well. I really liked the, when you were talking about the ghost betwixt, it sort of, the images that you shared with me, and yeah, I haven't played the game yet, but the images that you shared with me sort of reminded me of like like a Resident Evil game or something, you know, mm -hmm. like the the icons yep. for like the ammo and stuff like that, and then even just the status bar at the bottom of the images and and you know stuff like that, where I was like getting a really cool sort of like you said creepy like dungeon crawler kind of vibe. Um, yeah. Now you had mentioned that you uh, wanted to share some of the images. Do you like a screen share? Is there? Do you have some stuff lined up that you wanted to oh, yeah. that you wanted sure. to go through? Um, yeah. Just so people can get a really good idea of, you know, the the different kinds of board games that you've been working on, and um, you know what you want to show off. So yeah, this is the Ghost Betwix. Um, so this was a collaboration actually. So Travis Hansen did a lot of the art that you're seeing here, like the cover and a lot of the character art uh, but then i came in and i did everything else for this game so um like all the tokens all the card frames all the things on the cards you know things like that this was a really fun collaboration uh and then like you can see i was talking about like marketing images and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh so this is the zombie apocalypse game let's see so yeah, I kind of got free reign on all these cards. I got to do whatever I wanted for them. Nice. These zombies looking pretty good, pretty yeah. drippy. You yeah. know, you can see all the sketchy details and stuff. Yeah, and it's really you know I think for it's got like a almost like a paper quality to it. Like it doesn't look too. It's not so clean that it's obvious that it's digital. Mm. You know, it's got a really mm -hmm. nice um, kind of aged look to it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. 
<laughs> Got fat zombies. <laughs> Did that man, we've never seen that in a movie. They need to put that in a movie. A brain on a fish on a fish. Oh line? yeah, the lure. Yeah, that's man. amazing. They've never. I've not lure. seen anything like that in a zombie movie. <laughs> Let's do that in a zombie movie. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be a brain. Just something that the zombie would want to eat. You know, it's like. <laughs> This one was fun because like they had a bunch of character cards and I got to zombify the characters. Oh, sweet. So, like you can get turned into a zombie basically. Uh huh. The before and the after. Yeah, so you just flip the card over and then all of a sudden you're a zombie. It's pretty cool. And I got to do some really cool like action shots and stuff, mm. like the firebomb, the grenade. Mm-hmm. You know. That was a fun project. Uh, this is one my buddy Steve. Steve actually uh, owns a new game store slash coffee shop in Portland called Battlegrounds Coffee. Uh, go hit him up. He's on 39th and uh, Sandy. Uh, this was his design. And we worked on this fuck for like the two first two years of fucking COVID. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And got a lot done for it. Looks so clean. Yeah. I love the... Uh... Just the design on the that the bottom of the box, just the right here. Yeah, those yeah, designs so, are really so if, cool. So if you were to pull the box lid up, these would be the sides of the under part of the box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a really cool game. It's kind of like a skirmish, like uh, like dudes on a map, sort of fighting each other, and you play like 1930s detectives versus vampires and werewolves and stuff. It's called The Adventures of Dex Dixon. Mm, nice. <laughs> a hard a hard boiled detective at the end of his career. Good old detective story. Yeah. And d- man. Does it, is it getting into like does it get it into some a, sort of occult kind of thing? Is that what's going it, on it, here? It has some of it. Yeah, you can see by based on some of my uh design choices that there's yeah. some occult stuff going on. There's like a rift uh between the two worlds and the vampires are coming in trying oh, okay. to take over the good side. Yeah. Uh, but he's this is one of his original properties, Dex Dixon is, and he's done stage adaptations, he's done film adaptations, oh, all wow. sorts of stuff, Com- comic books. So there's plenty of lore out there. This game kind of just boils a lot of stuff down to the mechanics of like, oh, I'm controlling a character, I can put like items like a revolver and a talisman key, and I can play these events and stuff like that. Hell yeah. Is so you know, board games are so immersive. Is that, is that, was that the drawing point for you when you started getting into them? Was it just the immersion versus, you know, sitting back and reading a story or even playing a video game or, or watching a movie? Is that, was that the, the drawing point for you or, or was it, did that get you hooked? Yeah. Well, I mean, like most good board games take about as long as a movie does, you know, and Mm -hmm. they're a little more social because you get to hang out with your friends and talk about stuff as you're, as you're playing. And, um, it's competitive, which I think is healthy. You know, competition Mm -hmm. is really healthy as a human being. Um, uh, and you know, so at that point I was just like, you know, this is really fun. I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. <laughs> you know, I still can't stop thinking about games all the time. Systems, like how does this work with that? Like what's the most interesting thing? What would, be, what would the players find interesting? You know, like all these cards that you're seeing, they have a cost to play up in the corner. So like you don't just get to play these cards on the table. You have to like manage your resources and pay this little blue, you know, resource, whatever mm-hmm. it is in this game. Uh, so you can see the tokens right there on the table. Um and so, like, you know, it's just a lot of moving parts and it keeps everybody involved and keeps people coming back. You know, yeah. I can only watch a movie so many times before I'm like, I start to notice all the same things. It's kind of mm-hmm. the same with some games, you know, but for the most part, you can get a good, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours worth of entertainment. Yeah. Out of well, and it's going to be a little bit different every time, right? I mean, that's the, yeah. the, the cool it's thing. It's always going to play too. out. It's always going to play out a little bit different because you have so much randomization with the card decks, the yeah. dice, you know, all sorts of stuff. It's a choose your own adventure. Pretty much, man. Yeah. Uh, this one versus infected. This is a great project. So this guy came to me and he was a, a veteran and he was like, you know, I, I, I have a lot of military knowledge and 
I want to kind of incorporate it into this world that I've created, this post-apocalyptic world. Um, and I want you to bring it to life. And I pretty much, I had free reign on this project as well. That's awesome. Yeah. So you had like your different factions that you could play as. So I made these guys, the founders kind of like more of like a religious cultish fanatic faction. And then of course the infected, mm -hmm. the builders, you know, kind of like the lowly blue collars of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hey, they, and then you got the military. They what have to saying? exist, right? I'm just saying they have to exist. I mean, it's sort of like in uh, Land of the Dead, yeah. they kind of have that whole, you get to see that like tier system still exists even in the zombie right. apocalypse, like within right. you know Romero's world. It's like, yeah, those yeah. things don't go away, you know? Yeah, somebody's got to build your, you know, your gates and your, uh, mm -hmm. your cars. You know, people got to keep your cars running, keep your weapons, you know? running yeah uh and then of course this had the military uh aspect of it so you could play as the military as well so we had all sorts of like real military weapons in there you know, like the saw a glock you know mm -hmm. and then really cool events like stim patch you know to stop yourself from getting from getting damage a bunch of different zombie types like the crawler here oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, this one, I actually stole this from Land of the Dead, <laughs> the Distract Zombies card. Oh, yeah, Fireworks. yeah. I love yeah, that. Yeah. It's the Sky Flowers. <laughs> oh, the Sky Flowers, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I think it just makes, makes sense. I think Land of the Dead, like, it took me a couple of views to warm up to it. Like, the first time I watched it, I just didn't know what to think, because it was the first time I'd seen oh, a yeah. Romero movie in the theater. And it was mm -hmm. his first zombie movie since Day of the Dead, right? So Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, man, I don't know. And then the more I watched yeah. it, I was like, no, I, I, I like started coming around and realizing like, no, I totally, I get what he's trying to say here. And I started really enjoying like Simon Baker's performance is so good. Mm -hmm. The writing Johnny is Legs. really good. Dude. Yeah. I think Leguizamo, Legs. that's one of his best oh. roles. Like, and he so improvised good. a lot of those lines. Like he, George didn't write the line. Uh, You've been hanging out with Riley all day, painting the town gray. Like, <laughs> he, like Leguizamo like comes up with those lines like on the spot you know um and so I just like I know a lot of people for them it's just about the first three Romero zombie movies but I think Lance right, got right. quite a bit uh quite I a think bit it's pretty like. good yeah yeah it's pretty good and I even and, like uh, di some of Diary Diary yeah. Diary's not that bad of a found footage film honestly. yeah I think Diary does a lot. They accomplish a lot of things in that movie. There's a couple one takes in there that are pretty damn impressive and yeah. Romero always found a way with like not much resources and not really like big time actors. Most of the time, he always finds a way mm -hmm. to just like make it work. Like the guy was a hard worker. You can see it in every one of his films, like the, the great oh, ones yeah. and the, and the ones more in the middle, like he busted his ass. Um, and it's great to see, you know, it, uh, not like every zombie creative piece since then is inspired by him. But I think even if it, the people are unaware it's like that inspiration is sort of built in to the zombie world now that you, you might not even know that you're being inspired by George, but you're being inspired by George, you know, it's like, right. It's right. like every rock and roll band now sounds like the Beatles, even if they didn't listen to the Beatles, because the Beatles <laughs> right, influenced right. everyone after, you know, totally. Yeah, this is great. And having that military aspect, what was so what did like in your estimation, what did he bring, um, you know, to the piece through that military experience that made this different than um, the other projects you've worked on? Um, so this is a very like uh, real realistic sort of like tactical card combat game. So like you basically sit across from somebody and you're just dueling. Uh, you pick a faction and you're dueling, you know, um, but he would have like like he knew you know that the saw could could only shoot so many rounds before it jammed you know things mm. like that so there, there's all sorts of like cool uh flavor within the cards and the mechanics themselves that you know if you yeah. if if you were a gun guy and you you know and you knew some stuff about it that would come into play i mean besides that probably not much you know because it is set in a pretty fantastical world mm -hmm. you know uh but the one thing I really love about doing this project is I decided early that I wanted to kind of have this monochromatic greenish tint mm -hmm. to everything. Mm -hmm. 
So I just kind of like put that filter over every draw. I, I basically drew everything in black and white and then just put like a green over it and then uh, dotted in some red here and there to make things pop. Yeah. I like I like that look because it's sort of like yeah. the you know with the Walking Dead comic. I think the black and white worked so well, and I think mm -hmm. um, Night of the Living Dead you know looks great. I, oh yeah, I, I feel like that's yeah. one of those. It's a genre that like the the way you can do the makeup in like the way they did the makeup in Night. It almost benefits you that it's not in color because you don't have to. You, all you have to worry about is shading, right? So it's more about. Right finding like i kind of would i'd love to see a modern zombie movie that's black and white that just takes sure. advantage of of shading and then maybe red is the only color you see you know it's yeah. uh i i dig that because it just sort of helps it stand out a little bit more um and helps you focus i think that's another mm -hmm. thing too is it's not too busy right speaking of busy <laughs> so the this is one I completed probably a couple of years ago, and they were they had a pretty successful Kickstarter, uh, Journey Adventure Quest. Uh, this is a couple designers, and actually, um, so I did this cover and the full box work, and I did all the card frames, uh, and I did all the tokens and all the art for like these cards with green art on them, mm -hmm. uh, and then all those also the ones with the red. On it. But everything else, all these items were all done by the designer's daughter. Um, oh, wow. She was like, she was like fourteen at the time. Yeah. Dang. So like, so like, she drew that really cool like angel angel helmet, like uh -huh. this ice sword and stuff. She drew a bunch of the items uh, and the monsters too. She drew this Hydra. That looks great. Look at that. Look at that yeah. sweet like skull face and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but this was another one. I kind of actually enjoy this process of like. Uh, hey, we have some art already done for our game, but we need an actual game built around it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I was able to do all the token art, you know, all the boards and the card backs and the card frames and everything for them. I did the box art, uh, the box design, everything. And then, of course, their marketing uh, to create this really unified, uh, beautiful project. Wow, you know? yeah, it's gorgeous. And it looks immense. Yeah. It looks huge. Yeah, it's really not that hard. Like, uh, I don't, if any of your viewers play board games, I would put this in the same weight category as like wingspan. So. Uh, now, it, it's, it seems like, did Catan just really kick this like huge wave? Oh, yeah. But that was, that was of, early. Yeah. That was early. That was like two decades ago when Catan came out. Gotcha. You know? Oh, has it been uh, that long? I think the first time I heard of yeah. Catan, it was probably. <clears throat> 11 or 12 years ago was the first time I heard of it. But yeah, it seems like it really brought it to the forefront for people that, you know, maybe didn't grow up um, in that community or, or, or playing the more complex board games is it kind of brought it to like the pop culture world, you know, to where yeah. people are like, Oh crap. Like this is like, I have my own idea for a game that, Right. That now this has found its its spot, sort of like horror in the seventies and eighties was like, yeah, not many people are doing it. And now you got the <laughs> the uh, Australian backyard wrestlers doing talk to me, <laughs> right? Totally. But it just sort yeah, of makes definitely... people realize that it's attainable, you know? Right. We're definitely in a golden age of board gaming. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, every year, like on average, there's like twenty thousand new designs. Wow. Whether it's from larger publishers or just like smaller, like uh, self publishers, like I work with, so. And now they're taking uh, every popular movie and turning it into a board game. I've seen that, like all the some of them are pretty stuff. good. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. of them are pretty good. I like the Jaws. Jaws. I like the Jaws one. Yeah, yeah. Jaws is I, good. It's so funny though. Every time I play it with my family, my wife and my family, they all talk about like what they're gonna do, and I'm like, guys, you know, I'm the shark, right? Like, will you stop talking about your plans? Like, whisper your plans to each other. Like, what do you want me to hear you to say what you're going to do and not use it within the game? Like, I'm going to use it within the game. <laughs> right. Well, and what I love is like, there's so many designs coming out now that there's a lot of room for other themes. My biggest problem with Catan is it's just fucking boring as shit. Mm, yeah. um, Pretty basic. You know, like how many... How many times can I laugh at I'll trade wood for your sheep, you know? Sure. Uh, but like nowadays, like you're seeing all these designs that I do, uh, you know, themes can be 
at least to me, a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this looks gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, she did an amazing job on this, on the item art and stuff. Yeah, everything's so clean. Mm hmm Clean and well-defined. It's uh. If you look at the, the background behind these cards, this was mm -hmm. a map that she had drawn of the the whole entire world. And then I kind of took different parts of it and put it behind the image. Cropped it out, yeah. Cropped it out a little bit, yeah. So uh, this kind of game, uh, or for Journey Adventure Quest, um, how much does this one run if somebody watching right now wants to grab a copy? What are, what are you looking uh, at? I think 40 bucks. Yeah. So less than a video game and and yeah. dozens of more a hours little... of enjoyment. Oh, yeah. And less than like two tickets to the movies, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So. <sighs> Freaking movies, dude. And the, the worst thing about going to the movie, then you pay all this money and then you still have to worry about how the audience is going to be. When you're in there. <laughs> right. That exactly. to me is the, I went to a couple press screenings like recently and I'm like, man, this is, this has spoiled me for going to the movies because everyone <laughs> shuts the hell up in the press screening and they watch you yeah. the whole time. Like you can't pull out your phone or anything like that. <laughs> right. Right. So it's like, wow, I actually get to pay attention. <laughs> Yeah, I got to do the whole rule book for this one and everything. I've done a ton of rule books. They're super fun. It's like after you read a bunch of rule books, you kind of know how you would like them to be laid out. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's really bad ones and there's really good ones. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a great, great project. That was fun. So you're like you're getting spells and you're like equipping all these items and stacking them and like fighting these bosses. It's like a boss battler kind of. And is it cooperative? Like, you, can you play no, with multiple people on the same team or? No, it's competitive. So you're all you're all competing for points. So it's kind of like whoever defeats the most bosses gets the most points on these cards. Okay. You know, out in their play area, things like that. Yeah. Got the Cerberus there, the unicorn. Cool stuff. Yeah. This cover, I just kind of wanted to get the feeling of the game more mm -hmm. than anything. So I had like the lone journey adventure quester with like big troll boss in the background, the castle she's going to. Yeah. 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 yeah it's got that epic, uh, a little bit of that Zelda ish kind of vibe mm. there, a little bit there. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I got just uh, some more showcase stuff to showcase yeah, some sure. liabilities here. You know, uh, I think this was just something somebody commissioned me to do uh, just to see what their game would look like if I were to do the art for it. And he never ended up hiring me, but I really liked doing this work. So, I oh, cool. Yeah. Rage and Racers now is this kind of like a. a is it a post-apocalyptic like mad max kind of thing or is it just uh, a little bit yeah you can see like the little, little twisted metal vibe going on too yeah a little twisted metal or like uh like the old rage and race or what was the death race death what race? Was the D death race stuff yeah 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 that kind of stuff uh um, oh shit you did an mlb game <laughs> this is more commission work like somebody commissioned me to do all these i think they commissioned me to do like 150 different baseball players wow. and even some some from movies you know you oh got yeah yeah Ron that's great here and benny rodriguez from sandlot oh and the kid the, from uh, rookie of the, the year kid, rookie of the year yeah <laughs> I, I'm a I'm a big sports fan so i you know i'm kind of like nerdy about a whole bunch of stuff so uh yeah, yeah this is this is cool My, to see Adrian said, my wife said, uh, after I did these 150 baseball players, my humans were like a thousand times better than they used to be. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's good practice, right? Just to do something yeah, that's man. a little more cut and dry. A little, yeah, just yeah. trying to capture that real just life doing, look. Just doing pose work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, here's Tabletop Simulator. So we were talking about like, potentially oh, yeah. getting together and playing some games this would mm -hmm. be the program that we play on uh and you can see i i put a ton of my games like into this program so i have them saved in there 
What's that really experience cool. like? Is it pretty, uh, is uh, it pretty, pretty one for one? Is it close? It's yeah, it's pretty one for one. Uh, sometimes you have a hard time stacking things a little bit, but um, I mean, otherwise, like you can pick up the dice and roll them and stuff. They roll really well. Um, when you have a hand of cards, they're just kind of like in front of you, and nobody else can see that part. You know, and you can sort through them and things like that. Cool. Uh, and then, you can, then you can just like click and grab all the tokens basically and just like click on that and grab it and move it somewhere mm-hmm. i can move my camera angles around you know so nice. yeah it's pretty cool it's fun uh survivor z now this is a two-player game that i did this is my design uh it's still kind of in prototype form but i think i completed the yeah the tile art for this and got that done at least but everything else is kind of like just a little bare bones but mm-hmm. it's a fun like just 1v1 one person plays like four heroes you can see the hero boards out there mm-hmm. uh and then one person plays the zombies and they kind of pl- have super different play styles uh where the zombies is like playing out these cards every turn and the hero is like uh choosing what actions they want to do based on their boards uh but then you're just basically like fighting each other and there's win conditions for each scenario, you know, like kill 20 zombies or, you know, the zombies have to kill like three heroes or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah. That one's fun. I got to implement a lot of, you know, just like things that I would want to see in a zombie game, you know, like uh, boards. So this card boards, you basically just place a a token on the board that basically like uh, cuts off, entrance to a tile so the zombies have to attack that token before they can move on to the next tile oh, okay know? gotcha like you're just bored yeah up a win- bored you're up just a bored up a something. window or something yeah nice. yeah I'm setting up a barricade yeah cool stuff this is one of my bigger designs drive um so i i made this probably around the time that Mad Max Fury Road came out, and then the video game Mad Max also came out around the same time. And I really wanted to create, like, a game where people were playing as different factions uh, in, like, this desert apocalypse where you're roaming around the board. It's harder to move through the desert. It's easier to move on the roads, but more dangerous, Mm, you know? And there's, like, bandit. There's bandits that you have to fight. Like, this is the bullet boss from one of the bandits. There's bosses that you have to take out and stuff. It's a competitive game, so you're playing for points. Um, Really cool stuff. Like, being able to do all this post-apocalyptic art was super fun. Yeah, I love the art. Yeah, really. a lot of that, the scribbly detail, really, really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, this guy was super fun to draw. Just good world-building kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Even the, that, um, the NES girl that you shared with me, is that a character that you came up with? Cause that has a really cool, I really like all the different looks that you gave to her. Not, not to pull you away completely from this, but just looking at these pieces sort of reminded me of that. Cause the NES girl looks like it's post-apocalyptic as well. Um, Mm -hmm. A little bit of tank girl kind of vibes meets a, like I love how she has the Mario hat on in the one shot. And then, of course, yeah, the zapper and the power glove. <laughs> yeah, the power glove's getting a lot of play on this interview, Cole. Go, going from more, Freddy, Freddy's dead, more, to NES girl. More play than usual, right? <laughs> more, more play than anyone ever used the power glove for. Have you ever used that thing? Uh, the power glove? No. Mm-hmm. I, a buddy of mine, <laughs> when I was like seven or eight years old, I went to a birthday party where this kid got it. And we all okay. like tried to hook it up and use it. It did not work <laughs> the way it worked in the wizard. Let me tell you that. <laughs> you have to like key yeah, in a there. code for each specific game. It's wild. Yeah, there she is. I, yeah, I thought it would just be cool to draw like some post-apocalyptic world where the only technology really that exists anymore is Nintendo technology. <laughs> <laughs> So is this a character that you did you do a comic for her or, or no something? no it's just uh, like I basically just these are kind of just a series of sort of like mock comic book covers you know yeah because like I still want it like I still do comic art uh, and so like just doing a full series of this was a really fun way to get that that feeling you know yeah this yeah, one's cool I, she's like she's like wounded you know. 
smoking yeah. her last cigarette before she passes. <laughs> yeah, I love the. Uh, it's just cool to see that kind of you know pieces from your childhood. Like as I'm going through your art, I'm like, oh man. So you know, I'd already mentioned what like Gizmo and and Bill and Ted. There's like RoboCops in there and all that stuff. And then come across this NES girl, and I'm like, oh, this is really sweet. I've never seen anything like this before. Like. <laughs> Like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. She does her workout on a power pad or something like that. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, who doesn't want to see like hot girls and post apocalyptic stuff? So, exactly. Yeah. Showing off their tummies. Yeah. And, and um, you know, with a love for video game culture, who doesn't want to see hot yeah. girls that play video games? <laughs> you see this one? I got a little Easter egg here. I got the, the tunnel, the tubes in the background. So they kind of nice. look like they kind of look like spires, but they're like the tubes from Mario World. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, she was a cool character. Every once in a while, I'll create like a little character out of nowhere or something. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, like because you said that you try to, you know, keep away from the screen and stuff when you're not, you know, working or when it's, you know, not driven with purpose. But is there? But, you know, when you're, you just have an idea pop in your head, like you're just taking a walk or sitting around or eating a meal and you yeah. just, something pops in your head and you're like, okay, now I have to go do this. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what that one was, was, it was just like, you know, I want to draw some Nintendo stuff. I don't want to draw Mario or Link or you know, mm -hmm. anything else. And I kind of like drawing realistic looking humans more than like cartoonish stuff so mm -hmm. i mean you could say that this is a little cartoon it's more like comic book art you know but sure uh, what i mean is like realistic proportions yeah 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 not like a cartoon uh, yeah exactly yeah what did you think uh what did you think of the castlevania netflix series have you enjoyed those at all uh i haven't seen it no. oh really okay i'm sure i would like I, it I are like you a fan of the games oh yeah yeah, the uh, I like both of the series so far. So they did, I think they did like three or four seasons that are about Trevor Belmont and Sypha from mm -hmm. uh, Castlevania Three: Dracula's Curse, and then they moved on from there. And they did, they just have done one season so far. But it's like Richter and Maria from uh, Rondo of Blood, right? Um, and so it's really like super gory, like R rated kind of stuff like the very first ep maybe it's the first or second episode of the original series they're like tearing off people's heads and like ripping babies apart like the demons <laughs> like when dracula comes down to do his thing it gets very serious very quick <laughs> and uh <laughs> foul language and all that kind of stuff but it's also really cool to hear the music incorporated and then to you know see those characters like see trevor and sypha interacting it's so like anime um but just, I don't know. Like, I'm not the, I didn't grow up watching anime, but I certainly have an appreciation for it. So to see those worlds kind of come together where it's like probably my favorite video game series of all time is Castlevania. Um, yeah. I thought they did a really good job with the story. Love the art. Um, yeah, I'd recommend it uh, for you guys. Uh, do you want to see a, an interesting turn here? Um, yeah. So around the time I was doing the Nest Girl, stuff uh you can see the date there uh this little like thing the... called the pan this little thing called the pandy hit the world <laughs> and my art got a lot darker <laughs> and i think like i've got quick. is there a different I, i'm still seeing some of the board game stuff here is there a different spot where you're sharing that oh yeah let's see yeah that friggin pandemic man That'll change you. <laughs> That'll change you. <laughs> well, it's like my interview, you know, speaking with Brian, just like, man, it inspired a, a whole record. It basically kicked that off right. for him, you know? So it's like, yeah, it really does. When you're, you know, creating, it really does put you in a different spot. Yeah. This is right. a really cool piece. I really, I, again, I can tell it's you because of the, the way the ground looks and the way like the mm -hmm. tunnel, the tunnel, like that has got, Cole written all over it. <laughs> yeah, so I think I titled this one like Don't Look Back or something like that. It's just like dark times here. 
Yeah, and you're almost but like that could be. I didn't like, realize I wasn't actually showing the Ness girl, so you can see like from the very vibrant sort of like yeah. comic booky fun times, <laughs> like very dark, mm -hmm. brooding. Like, what is that in the background? Exactly. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> you know, what is that? <laughs> uh, yeah, and it kind of keeps going here for a couple more. Let's see. <laughs> yeah like obvious pandy vibes oh for sure yeah <laughs> yeah the world's falling apart but at least i got my phone yeah. i still need to be buried is, in my phone <laughs> yeah this is when i started to get a little bit more political just because it was like everything was getting political yeah at this moment in time it seems like that's so, the way know. that the powers that be just kind of want to push it to where everyone's well, sort yeah, of stressed that's... out in a political way like no matter yeah. where you fall on the spectrum you're just supposed to be yeah. stressed out about it because then you have a man a master to answer to you know yeah and you can pick a team and i've never yeah. been like too into picking teams but um yeah they, they definitely make you feel like i'm not a big sports fan so yeah to me it's just uh blue versus red they make you feel like yeah. you have to it's like it's a very odd like oh man i just i'd, I'd like to get <laughs> I, can i just get along with the most people possible and, and <laughs> right, you don't have exactly. to agree on everything you don't have to like right. everything i like and and yeah, we can still don't be make buds. me try to like all the things you like yeah, yeah just don't try to kill me i won't try to kill you and i won't try to push <laughs> my beliefs on you fair is fair <laughs> that shot is hilarious that is more great. obvious pandy vibes here yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that it's like the, like the pandemic meets the uh sailor at the end of world war ii kissing the nurse <laughs> you know <laughs> totally totally this is kind of like my feelings about everyone's reaction to everything you know it's like mm -hmm. is this the future you want you know yeah that is great outside sprawled on the wall back there yeah that that is a creepy image right there yeah man i look back at these and i get i get goosebumps i shudder i like how the feelings were back then yeah yeah you just never know what when we were going to crawl out of it that's a really cool shot too mm-hmm yeah, I already like I preemptively pulled a bunch of these because I'm like, well, I don't know what Cole's going to share, but I know that I'm going to for sure, like, you know, grabbing a whole bunch of these to to showcase. So this is perfect. Uh, I think the the Waco biopic show was on mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. man. <laughs> That whole thing was wild. I remember that being a big deal when I was what gosh, the show. Was the show late. was pretty good because they like they left it very ambiguous about like whose fault it was. Like they mm. made you, they made you really not like the Branch Davidian people because they were basically like raping their own children. Sure, but also like the feds just like intentionally setting everybody on fire was pretty fucked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wasn't that was so that was a joke? janet reno thing uh, uh i think she was heading that when that happened oh right, 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 right yeah i don't i don't remember much about the politics of it but i the show that came out is really good um it was like a it was like a six series mini series or something um or six episode mini series and they just kind of like illustrated how like you know humanity is in general is just pretty fucked up and like i don't think there were any correct sides to be on in this situation so. yeah yeah that's yeah. that uh that romero lesson it's like it's not the zombies it's the people that always it's mess it people. up in those movies yeah yep. the zombies are just yeah. the catalyst they're just the issue that tears people apart yeah yeah that's gorgeous that's another creepy one <laughs> <laughs> like kind of like everybody has blood on their hands yeah was what was what we were being told you know yeah. Uh, yeah. Stay inside, or you're guilty of you. You might be killing your grandparents if you don't yeah, stay inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's part of the reason that we ended up moving to the south. We just couldn't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, I'm so happy that we weren't in Portland during all that. Cause, yeah. uh, yeah, you're really lucky. <laughs> you're yeah, really we, lucky. we escaped, gosh, nine months before it all happened is, is when we moved. So really yeah. fortunate. I mean, you know, stuff still got a little crazy here in the Phoenix area, but, um, it's a little bit more of a purple kind of area, politically speaking. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. whereas it felt like in Portland, they're just going to lean into one way on that one. Yeah, there's not that much diversity of thought there at mm -hmm. all. And then we visited since then, and it's uh, pretty. It's even more depressing <laughs> it's, than it was. It's still pretty bad. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Oops. Where did we go? Where did we go wrong here? I love the uh, the Andy Warhol like lament configuration piece that you have oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go by that one. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Like that pop art kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is all, I think this is all uh, in order of last modified. So this is kind of like me getting out of that slump. <laughs> like, I need to do something a little more colorful. <laughs> See, this is something that like people would, like, I know horror people would love to put this up on their wall. Like this is. Oh, yeah. And oh, in yeah. such a joyful way to represent your fandom <laughs> for Hellraiser. <laughs> this is another one of those where I just had the idea. You know, it's like. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, mean, I think it was right after I watched New Nightmare, uh, and I saw an Andy Warhol of Freddy in uh, uh, the producer's office. What's it, Shea? Bob Shea? Oh, yeah, yeah. office, when Heather's in there talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this, you could do it for so many series, right? You could do, oh, like, yeah. you could do one that's like each Ghost Michael face. Myers mask from each movie. Yeah. So it's like not technically the same, but then you could do, yeah. yeah, the Freddy glove, the hockey mask, like the whole thing. Yeah. Or like just one image of Ghostface with the knife just mm -hmm. repeated, but in different colors. That'd be beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Speaking of Ghostface, <laughs> I do really like that shot you have um, where it's like he's obscuring his own name. Like going for like the backhand stab. I think that I think that's what it is. Uh, right here, yeah. He's gonna do the slash. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, that image, it looks like it's from one of the movies, and I'm totally forgetting. It, did you did you uh, look at an image from the movie for it? Or yeah, a lot of times I'll look at reference. Because yeah, stuff. it looks really good. I'm yeah. yeah. That's a great. I'll shot. do I'll do a uh, I'll do a combination of looking at reference and then uh doing some selfie poses like i'll mm. set up the camera and just do a, a pose uh for that image that i want to nice. get yeah yeah you could see like my more recent stuff is like way more colorful mm -hmm. right that 80s this, kind like, of vibe then this like drab depressed yeah <laughs> but that looks really out. cool that's that's some good shit right there though <laughs> <laughs> yeah nobody wants to go in that house <laughs> it's like the but evil also, dead no, cabin nobody but... wants to stay outside either so. yeah exactly <laughs> that was like i think this is towards the end of the pandy where it's like i don't know if i can be any inside anymore but this is what they're telling me it's like outside so. yeah <laughs> and then you've got that uh there's a they live piece that you've got that it's titled i think it's titled trump or something so i guess that it's supposed to be yeah, there you go. Yeah, I it, think it might have been. But I, I think this was the. This I must love have been the whole, election year. Yeah, yeah 20, they, they live. Yeah. They live does such a great job of just sort of exposing that. Uh, <laughs> you know that you're always being advertised to. It's so funny to me that that Obey yeah. company became really big, using that oh, clothing yeah, company, company using that thing, and yeah. I'm like, well, that's that's how funny is that that, you know, you take this slogan from a a movie and then you turn it into this like expensive fashion, which is right. Sort of right. like what the whole movie is trying to say is that this Consume. is what's constantly happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to your viewers, nobody judged me. This was 2016 and I lived in Portland. So, yeah. Well, and I think it's just like, you know, it's, it's no it's secret every that every politician, when, right. Yeah. Sure. And when Carpenter made They Live, they say that it's like, you know, it was his commentary on Reagan. But it's, yeah, it's applicable all the time, you know, because. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would have never thought that was Trump except for the piece was called Trump. So if I just Ooh. looked at the art, I would just figure, oh, that's a just, yeah, that's any sort of politician or rich person or what, you know, part of the elite. Right. 
Because I right. think that's the idea is all the aliens in They Live are just the elite class um, right, right, running right. everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, this was a pretty fun piece. This is just an idea I had. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I, I have this on my t-shirt site, and I think this is sold more than like any other design on that site. <laughs> there, man, the Star Trek fans are out there in droves, as we all know. And uh, yeah, this stuff, this stuff speaks to them. That's great. <laughs> West Side. West Side. Uh, this one's pretty good too. Yeah, I really like the the Frankenstein. Get a little Monster Squad reference in there. Yeah, well, and then the, you did the uh, Wolfman one. That's the Nards. Yeah, Nards <laughs> with the question that's mark. One of my favorite uh, YouTubers <laughs> is a guy named he. His channel is Wolfman's Got Nards. He's a, oh yeah, a yeah, Scottish guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Monster Squad. Out. Man, talk about like I, I think I like it more than the Goonies, and I grew oh, yeah, up with both. But yeah. I like I remember as a kid, it was one of those movies where I probably rented the Monster Squad on VHS like three or four times a year when I was a kid because it was just one of those go to. Like I loved seeing all the Universal monsters. I thought they were depicted so well. Like all the effects and character design is so like faithful to the original, but also updated for the eighties. And the kids were just yeah. like swearing and talking about oh, yeah. like smoking cigarettes and talking about vir <laughs> virgins and <laughs> yeah, it was way cooler than the Goonies, man. I, I yeah. talk about like uh, you know family friendly horror movies that we just yeah. don't see anymore. You know, yeah, and um, also like some real drama going on with like the oh yeah, you know his the parents like not getting along and the dad just you know being really involved in his work and also not yeah. taking the kids seriously at first and then realizing you know that especially like the, i guess it's the wolfman guy that doesn't even run to the police station he's like you have to lock me up like yeah oh like, yeah please lock me up this is going to get really bad yeah yeah and if it, like comparing it to the goonies is kind of hard cuz the goonies is like you know it's it's so iconic but I mean, if you watch the Goonies again, like I have uh, nieces and nephews that are like anywhere from six to 11 now. And we watch all that kind of stuff. The Goonies is a really annoying movie <laughs> like the whole That's time. All, all the yelling. The, the Fratellis are annoying. The kids are annoying. Everybody's just yelling the whole time. Mm -hmm. It's like the only downtime we really get is with uh, Brandon and Andy when they're just like alone, you know? Yeah. The yeah, older, the, the older sibling and his girlfriend. Yeah, and I guess yeah. like the you know the comparisons are just the fact that it's like a bunch the a kids group are, of kids. Yeah, the yeah, kids are the leads, and they're after there's like a quest kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Lo I love Reanimator. God, it's such a fucked up movie, but I really love it. it <laughs> it's like every time I watch it, it seems more fucked up than the time before. And then oh, yeah. the the first time I watched it with Kate, I was like. Uh, this is a weird movie to watch with a lady. <laughs> Once it gets to the head in the pan scene and you're just sort of like, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, never, so. I never felt this awkward watching this movie. And now that a lady's <laughs> next to me, I feel like kind of a pervert. <laughs> and then you look over and she's laughing and you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh barbara crampton can't go wrong with her man she is still you're like, doing it and then you're like will you marry me <laughs> yes oh my I, fi I got to meet her this past december at a con out here i was like so nervous i, I could hardly tell <laughs> so She's this like piece... 65 and still looks great <laughs> oh yeah so this piece and a lot of my earlier stuff uh Kind of apes uh, one of the artists, the comic artists I was talking about, Francesco Francavilla. Um, he tends to do these like heavy blackened areas mm. with like f a lot of bright focus on the character with these like odd choices of flats, right? So, like, this is like very orange and purple and green, right? Like, who puts those colors together? <laughs> yeah. But but this is very like I think the style was heavily inspired by Frank Francesco Francavilla. So if you like, if anybody likes the style, I highly urge you to go s seek his stuff. Yeah, I will show. Like I'll overlay some of his art too, so people yeah, can get yeah. an idea. And yeah, uh, go we find can, some pieces you like. Yeah, yeah, and we can leave a link in the description below for anything and cool. everything that we show off here. We'll make sure to share. Absolutely. Cool. Yep. 
Videodrome. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's the Evil Dead piece. Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. God, I love that <laughs> font. That that Evil Dead font's so iconic and. Oh yeah, 2013 movie. It's like every few months I just want to rewatch it. The the sound design and the way it looks mm-hmm. and the way the story plays out. It's just perfection. Well, do you want to pivot into some of the horror board games? Some yeah, yeah. Let's uh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, let's get into some of the horror board games that you're really digging lately. Yeah. So. Uh, not only do I work in board games, I also can play a lot of board games. So, <laughs> uh, and horror is my favorite genre, and so why would I not want to play horror board games? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I was saying about us kind of being like a renaissance or golden age of horror of of board games in general, uh, it's given way to all the different types of themes that you could want and honestly like i almost wouldn't bring just any game like an easy game out to a new player or like somebody that's interested in gaming uh, i would almost just find a theme that i think they would like Mm -hmm. and try that it doesn't really matter like how complex the game is uh you know there's a certain level where i'd be like well maybe we should hold off and play something else first but you know um I think if you if you get them excited enough about what's on the table in front of them, they're going to sit there and learn it and they're going to have fun, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, to me, that's horror board games. So um, I'm just going to run through kind of like, I think probably my top five right now of horror board Perfect. games. Hell yeah. yeah so um, one of them is called, this is a really cool game. It's a solo only game. So it's like, Kind of like playing a video game or something, right? So it's mm-hmm. all like cards and stuff in front of you. It's called Final Girl. Um, this was a Kickstarter project by Van Ryder Games. And uh, they first did a run of six different sort of scenarios that you could play. Uh, and you could back the Kickstarter and get all six of them. And each scenario comes in this cool... I've actually got boxes over here. It comes in this cool box that has the f- the final girls on the cover so you get two different final girls to play as and then this box comes apart like this and you've got the killer whatever killer oh, you're playing, nice. playing against so this is hans he's kind of like the shape you know he's the mm-hmm. faceless masked killer basically he's wearing a pig mask <laughs> and then on the other side you've got the location that you're playing at wow. this is camp happy trails right the camp where, yeah. he, where he lives right uh and everything everything is uh a trope of horror movies like they've got freddy they've got uh, the thing they've got alien they've got mm-hmm. uh, the the guys from your next it's called the intruders you know yeah things like that but the cool thing about this system is you can take any any uh, villain in any location and intersperse them. So I could take like the spaceship from Alien and put Hans on there and fight Hans yeah. on the spaceship. You That's know? so awesome. Yeah. And they've all got these different mechanics and stuff like that. You know, uh, and like I said, you can play the different Final Girls. They all have special powers, things like that. So yeah, really now cool are, system. Are those pieces? Are those board pieces? Like, is there a magnet in there that snaps them into the box, or is that how that works? Yeah, yeah. That's gorgeous. Yeah. The magnets on, on the edge like that, yeah. Physical media, man. It's just... Uh... So, yeah. Yeah, you've been talking a lot about physical media. I think board games are, like, the last vestige of print media. Like, mm. you look behind me, a lot of this stuff was created within the last five years. Yeah. You know? Uh, and it's going strong. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't really digitize board games. Like, you can, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, the whole point is the, like you were talking about, it's like the social aspect. Um, it's yeah. getting getting together with people in the same location, you know? It's like opening a new game and like seeing what's in there, smelling the, the smell, you know, the yeah. smell of like opening a pack of cards or something, like yeah. freshly printed cards, you know, like that old smell. Mm-hmm. It's just, there's nothing like it, you know? Another one is called Terror Below. So... 
Terror Below is basically Tremors the board game. Um, this is another one that was on Kickstarter uh, a couple of years back. You look at the cover. Oh, yeah. It's a giant worm, you know, with a guy in the pickup truck. You know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So in this game, you're actually like, uh, you're driving around the map and it's competitive. So you're trying to be the last survivor, basically. Uh, and these worms are attacking the map everywhere, you know, and coming up and you can kill the worms and get points that way, <laughs> things like that. Um, it's a really cool game. And it's it's kind of beer and pretzels is what we like to call it, where it's like uh, there's not a lot of like very high strategy going on, you know. Sure. Uh, it's a lot of dice roll, dice chuck in, like hoping you don't get hit by stuff, you know, yeah. things like that. By all these giant worms attacking everywhere, uh, but it's a it's a blast. It's a lot of fun to play. It's the only thing like it, and I love Tremors. Like Tremors is one of my uh, all time favorite movies. Yeah, yeah, I think just because. Of that era, just because Kevin Bacon is amazing in it, and he's so likable. All the characters are so likable. Yeah, um, and you just don't want to see anything bad happen to him. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, no, that it's such a love they're letter. They're such to a those... precarious situation. You know, like I love those sort of like isolation type of horror movies where you just feel like you can't get out. You mm -hmm. know, so yeah, they yeah. have to deal with the issue at hand, and it's uh, yeah. Tremors to me is like this perfect, it's like a love letter to those old like Corman, like creature features, mm -hmm. like fifties and sixties creature features. Also a little bit of that jaws vibe because like they're, they're yeah. kind of on the hunt for them, you know, and like throwing yeah. out the dynamite on the string and like, or on the rope and pulling <laughs> it and like yeah. really, really fun. Um, just like a perfect popcorn movie and like yeah. and so rewatchable. I love, I love movies where, uh, the rules are so kind of like set and you get to learn the rules kind of as you go, you know, and Tremors mm -hmm. does that really well. It's like, you know, Oh, they can stand, you learn that they can sense vibration, you know? So like, mm -hmm. Oh, everybody has to be really quiet, you know, all this. Yeah. <laughs> and you learn, you learn as they learn. So it's like, you feel as like you're, learn. you're with the characters. Like you're one of the yeah. people isolated. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to the bloody inn. <laughs> The Bloody Inn is a really cute little game. <laughs> it's cute, the Bloody Inn. It's very cute. Uh, the art is amazing. The art style on this. Mm -hmm. Very, like, scratchy and kind of just weird color choices. Love it. Um, but in this game, so this is a card game where the cards have multiple different uses. So you can use them in, like, four or five different ways. Um, I think to play cards, you actually have to discard cards out of your hand. So as the currency, right? Oh, okay. But the point of the game is we all run our own uh, inn in this weird like little French town or something like that. And we're trying to kill the most people and bury their bodies and steal their money. So whoever has the most money <laughs> by the end is the winner. <laughs> oh my gosh. So the things that throw a wrench in there is like, so all these guests come out like every round basically. And they're kind of like waiting for their turn to get into the inn. Right. But some of them are police officers. So mm. if, if by the end of the round, nobody's killed a police officer, he'll do an investigation. And if anybody has any unburied bodies in front of them, they get mm. docked points. Right. Yeah. So, so really cool little mechanic and a, and a cool like point of tension where you're like, oh, I really, I have a couple of bodies and I have no place to bury them, you know, and there's this cop out there. You know what? What's one more body? I'll just kill the police officer and put him in there with my unburied bodies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but you that don't starts know. to stack up. Yeah. And you don't know if he's a cop, right? Until then. No, you know, he's a cop. Oh, okay. At the beginning okay. of the round, it came out and you're like, oh shit. I've only got two spaces to bury bodies and I've got four bodies in front of me. I have to, by the end of the round, I think you have like three actions during the round. By the end of the round, I got to get places down to where I can bury those bodies. And then I have to bury the bodies. That's not going to happen with three actions because it takes yeah. five actions to do all that. So I'm just going to kill that cop. <laughs> I need to make a business decision here. <laughs> yeah. And then all the bodies just start stacking up and, you know, 
<laughs> it's so, it sounds like a like an episode of like an old Tales from the Crypt or something like some sort oh, of really. just like morbidly oh, hilarious really. kind of yeah. uh, adventure. <laughs> totally, man. Um, and it plays pretty quick. The thing I love about it again is, like I said, the, those multi-use cards. So you draw the cards into your hand, um, and they can be played as guests. They can be played um, as kill cards. They can be played as the places where you're burying the bodies, things like that. So. Yeah, it's it's super fun. The bloody end. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the final one on my list, which is definitely not my least favorite, is uh, Legendary Encounters Alien, which is a cooperative deck building game based in the Aliens universe, twentieth uh, century Fox. So I have the box right here. Pretty large and in charge. Beautiful. You see the egg on there. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, But there's a lot of stuff going on in this game. There, I think there's like 500 cards or more in this box. Yeah, it's huge. It's pretty heavy and pretty. uh, It comes with this big play mat that you get to play on and stuff. Um, But the thing I really love about this game is it comes with all four of the original four movies. So you've got Alien, Aliens, Alien 3, and Alien Resurrection to play through. Nice. Uh, and they feel like you're playing those movies. Okay. Like, like I think well, one of the perfect examples is in uh, Aliens, the second one. Uh, you have to set up sentry guns in the corridor. Uh, so the aliens that are popping out, they start getting shot down by the sentry guns and things mm-hmm. like that. And that's your objective, right? That's one of your yeah. objectives like, in the middle of the game is to do that. Uh, and then in the third, the last objective is to like find Newt, you know, mm-hmm. like because she gets taken by the queen, right? Like at yeah. the end of the movie. Uh, so really flavorful. It really feels like you're playing those movies. The decks that you're building are like you're building the deck during the game. So, uh, you're basically taking cards that are like, oh, this is an Ellen Ripley card, or oh, this is a Corporal Hicks card, or a Hudson card, you know? Um, and they kind of get bonuses. You're putting them in your deck, and then you're shuffling your deck, and then you're playing with that. So you never know really what you're going to get from turn to turn. But you mm-hmm. kind of craft your deck to be like, oh, I'm going to be really good at fighting, or I'm going to be really good at like helping my teammates, you know, things like that. Um, and then like all the if you if I buy a bunch of Ripley cards, they're going to synergize with each other. You know, yeah, things like that. So, uh, really cool game. I recommend. There's a Covenant expansion where you get to play through Covenant as well, oh, which, cool. uh, which you know, Prometheus is not an alien movie, but Covenant definitely is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's like a little bit at the end of Prometheus that feels like aliens, but Covenant for the most part is a full fledged alien movie, and it really comes through in this game as nice. well. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I man, I've seen Covenant maybe just once. I think. Okay. Yeah. I I really liked Prometheus for what it was. I thought that it was a really cool oh, sure. like, world building movie and just a sure. little more, um, a little more high art, I guess. You know, as far for as sure. like what what they're trying to go for there. Um, yeah. It almost seems like Prometheus would have been better, like just without trying to shoehorn in the alien aspect. Um, exactly. That's why I said it wasn't really an alien movie. Like, yeah. In my eyes, at least. Yeah. It, like, and then the producers were like, all right, well, next time, can you just do an alien movie? And he's like, okay, yeah, God, please. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's some cool stuff in Covenant. The backbursters, like mm-hmm. when that guy's like, it's like coming out of his spine and shit. Like, yeah, that's pretty scary, man. And uh, Evil David and stuff. Like, Sure. Yeah, da- yeah. That whole, just that song and dance with him as far as like, where does he stand? And like, what mm-hmm. is he responsible for? And all that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you know you got to put some evil robots in your in your alien stuff. So <laughs> Absol- you have to. And then I think my biggest gripe with those last two movies was um, scientists doing like really really stupid things and not like thinking like right. scientists. <laughs> right. Which in you can excuse. when he grabs the snake and it just like fucking fucks just, him up. Yeah. Yeah. Just all the weird kind of like like this is not how scientists don't act like bros. They're not like. Tom Hardy <laughs> tough guys that are like, no, I'm just going to do what I want. Like, I'm going to stick my face in the, this little creature that I have no idea what it is. I'm going to stick my face like right up in front of it. Um, which in the original movies, it's not really like that because they're not 
technically like all scientists, you know, it's like, it just, it, right. it's, it makes sense a little bit more that they would be making foolish decisions. And at least, especially in the original one, you've got Ripley. That's like, and we are absolutely not letting these people back in. And then of course, you know, right. Um, Ash is going to do what Ash wants to do because <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's got his programming as well. Uh, that, that looks, that sounds really cool. Like the idea of sitting down, and getting to play through each one of those scenarios. Cause yeah, the first four alien movies are so damn different from each other. Oh, yeah. You know, they're just yeah. so the first one's like a haunted house vibe. Then you've got like your action vibe and, um, mm -hmm. you know, part three is a really kind of, there's just something creepy and dirty about alien three. Like the whole look, the film has this like rusty kind of look, um, you know, just obviously her in prison with a bunch of sickos. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> and then Resurrection, where, Resurrection was that Joss Whedon? Did he write that story, I think? I think so, yeah. He didn't direct yeah. it, but he wrote it, yeah. Yeah. Because that yeah. one, you've got um, Brad Dourif always entertaining, you know? <laughs> That's like, I wonder if Brad Dourif's going to be a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh, what yeah. are they going to do <laughs> here? Is, is Rob Zombie the only person to ever cast Brad Dourif as a good guy? <laughs> Like that's that's how sem gross semi-ironically yeah <laughs> yeah that's how gross rob zombie characters are is he's like right, well, i'll get generally. brad durif to play the good guy yeah he's not go. that bad yeah compared to bill mosley come on <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> right well cole I, gosh man we've been at it for almost three hours is that right yeah, am i reading I, the that's what i figured that's heck what yeah I figured would happen. <laughs> that's what's up yeah, well, yeah. thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me, um, you know, go through your journey as an artist and also just get to kind of shoot the shit about, uh, you know, movies and board games, all the kind of stuff that we love. Um, yeah, I'm loving everything you're doing. You've got such a style that I can't wait to see just how you continue to grow as it goes on, because I know it's every project is a, a new journey and it's like the work is never done. I always talk about, you know, every artist is always, uh, you know, whether or not they're comfortable within their voice, you're always like kind of searching to find a more refined version of that voice or just, you know, what is more comfortable to you. And as you change as a person, your art's going to change as well. So it'll be really right. great to uh, continue that journey and, see what you tackle next. I'm pumped. Awesome, dude. Well, yeah, you keep up the good work too. I've really been enjoying all the stuff on your channel. I like how diverse your content is. Like, um, I feel like I can always log on and you're going to have a different type of video for me to watch Sweet, every man. week. So that's pretty awesome. So. That's that's so great to hear because you never know what's going to stick when you throw everything at the wall. But, you know, it's one of those things like the, the YouTubers that I've looked up to and some of them that I've been lucky enough to hang out with. They're like, hey, as long as you're passionate about what you're talking about, like it's going to come yep. across. So just that's make sure you're doing videos yep. about stuff that you care about. And um, and yeah, just find that voice. I really love doing this kind of stuff. The interview game is really fun for me because um, it's a not only is it a great way to catch up with people that I haven't been able to talk with or hang out with in a while, but it's also a really cool opportunity just to show folks that are, um, you know, maybe not familiar with your work or maybe they're, you know, to show people that maybe they're not super creative themselves, just a little bit of insight to, uh, what mm -hmm. that world is like. And that, uh, um, you know, it's something that I think that everyone has the potential for. So even the people it's like, heck, you could be 40 years old and never, drawn or been creative in your life and it's never too late to you know just see you know scratch that itch and and see what comes out you know it's uh oh yeah man it's a skill you can learn how to do it don't don't let anyone tell you that you have to be talented yeah thank you so much again for hanging with us and uh let's chat soon let's uh let's not yeah. wait years like we did this time but let's uh the next time you've got a project coming up or something let's uh let's get you on here and we can help promote it and uh, I think we should do like a little bit of a, a board game night. So maybe I can uh, wrangle a couple of uh, fellow YouTubers in and we could uh, play one of your games and, uh, awesome. and just and go through it and uh, show it off that way and show people Great. the proof, proof is in the pudding there. Yeah, so, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, I'll look forward to it. Go support Cole's art. I think, you know, supporting independent artists uh, is one of the most important things that, that you can do. So go check out the t-shirt shop. I think that's a, a really uh, quick get for people that want to just have a cool design there on a shirt. So uh, until yep. next time, I've been and will continue to be Davey Deathray. Take care. <laughs>